So uh, thank you very much uh, for inviting me to speak. I had no idea that I'd been for a filter. Uh, all that nets were involved in this evening's talk, so these are too alarming. All that there was going to be a survey afterwards, so uh, many alarming mm -hmm. aspects have been highlighted to me in the introduction. Uh, and I've also discovered I'm the season finale, which uh, so I, I hope I will take you out with a bang. Um, so I'm going to talk today uh, about volcanoes, um, and I'm going to start off with this image here. So this image is from the Arfat Yerkut volcano in Iceland that erupted in 2010. And I'd almost I'd put money on there being at least a couple of people in this room uh, whose travel plans got disrupted by this, this volcano here. Um, yeah, there's a majority of the room, perhaps, it seems. <laughs> um, so obviously this, this volcano uh, reminds us of one of the reasons that volcanoes are important. So volcanoes and understanding volcanoes are important because they're hazards. Um, and in this instance here, obviously, the hazard wasn't actually realised because airspace was closed um, and, uh, and everybody, there, was, there was no loss of life, but there was an enormous economic loss. So that managing that hazard had an, an economic um, uh, outcome there. Um, but what I like about this picture is that it's also got uh, various other things going on. So let's take this, this bolt of lightning going on here. So uh, this answers a very, very important question, which is how do I make a picture of a volcanic plume more spectacular? Well, I put a bolt of lightning in it, and then it's even better still. And actually, it's no, it's no uh, coincidence this lightning is here. This has been generated by the processes going on in the volcanic plume. And the reason I draw this to your attention is that one of the other reasons, I'm going to mainly focus on hazards today, but one of the other reasons I'm really fascinated by volcanoes is because they're, of their importance in actually forming the planet that we live on today. Uh, and these, these bolts of volcanic lightning are actually uh, one of the candidates for building the very first molecules of life. You get some really wacky chemistry going on in those high temperatures in that, in that bolt of lightning. And using the cocktail of gases coming out of the volcano, that's one of the ways we might have made those first molecules of life. And then the third reason that I'm really passionate about studying volcanoes, which is again illustrated by this image here, this, this volcano is in Iceland. In fact, if you, um, if you Google how to pronounce Ayafat the Yerkut, um, you can get a really great uh, YouTube video, I think you can still get it, which is all the news readers around the world trying to pronounce this, this, this <laughs> volcano name. When it, when it happened. I mean, can you imagine, poor things, you're used to reading things off your auto cue, and then this word comes up. I mean, you, you know, the panic in their eyes is pretty much palpable. And if you haven't seen it, I really recommend it. It's a, a great five minutes of your life spent. And of course, they just end up, they, they ended up and sort of all decided just to call it the Icelandic volcano, um, which is all very sensible. And they were all very relieved when Grimsverton went off and it was much easier to pronounce. Um, but anyway, the, uh, this, this volcano is Iceland. Actually, Iceland gets a really significant fraction of its energy from geothermal power. And if any of you are fortunate enough to go to Iceland, which is, I really recommend, absolutely beautiful place, every little tiny hamlet you go to has its own um, thermally heated swimming pool. It's wonderful. You know, they really are, they're using their, their resources there, their geothermal power to... So volcanoes are, are hazards. They're planetary-scale processes that are important for us, but they're also resources. Uh, and one of the projects I'm not going to talk about today that I'm working with is in East Africa, where we're trying to understand their volcanoes better so that they can better uh, harness their geothermal power there. Um, the other reason, uh, so I was just, of course, the, the Icelandic volcano, Ayafat Jök, caused all this chaos. And I'm sorry if some of you were captured in this sort of uh, scenario here. You just see this, this, this board here, the arrivals board, just saying delay, delay, cancel, 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 cancelled, uh, and all the rest of it. So, so you know, it, it, the, the, the reason for putting that image up is also to remind us that us in this country, although we live in a very tectonically benign part of the world, uh, we are susceptible to the economic damage, certainly, that volcanoes can meet out. Um, the other reason for putting it up is to remind us why this is important. And I put this up because I, I, this is... This story is a, is a fascinating story when you think about the disruption that came out. This is the story of BA Speedbird 9, which uh, in 1982, basically by mistake, flew through an eruption cloud. And this was sort of what it was all about in 2010. So uh, they had four engines, and at uh, 11 kilometers altitude, all four engines cut out. 
12 minutes later before they could actually restart the first engine uh, at four kilometers altitude. So they dropped seven kilometers in altitude with no engines firing. Um, and when they got down, when they managed to do the emergency landing in Jakarta, the windscreen was so abraded they couldn't actually see the runway. And this is a picture here of the, the sand blasting on one of the light covers. But the main reason I like to tell this story is because uh, I, loved, I really do enjoy to read out this quote from Captain er er Eric Moody, who was the captain on this flight, which I think is possibly the most British thing <laughs> I've ever heard, which is, uh, ladies and gentlemen, <clears throat> this is your captain speaking, we have a small problem. All four engines have stopped. We're doing our damnedest to get them going again. I trust you are not in too much distress. <laughs> Um, I can't imagine what the, the, the scene was like in that, uh, in that cabin when that message... I mean, they probably noticed the engines had stopped anyway. But uh, this idea that you could possibly not be in too much distress when all four engines cut out at 11 kilometres. But it's the most sort of fantastically British response. Uh, and this is Eric Moody here in, in, the, uh, in the, the middle there. So this is the Glungan volcano, and this is where they eventually managed to, to land and a, a picture of the eruption. So this is what people were trying to avoid in 2010 when so much of our airspace was closed. Um, and it was a very interesting uh, time in 2010 in terms of uh, we moved from a situation where there'd been a zero tolerance to volcanic ash. So the idea was that aeroplanes just should not fly through any volcanic ash at all. And the issue was in 2010, this just became completely unmanageable. So the uh, regulatory authorities had to change, uh, change, change their basically having levels that were acceptable. And this actually has created new problems for us as volcanologists to deal with. But uh, I won't dwell too much on those today. But it's interesting, we're now trying to deal with not just a, a binary situation where there's either we need to t say where there is ash or not ash, we now need to think about the grayscale and how we understand where we are in that grayscale. But in both of these instances, if I've had Yerkut and this, this, uh, the, this particular eruption here, there was no loss of life, which was very fortunate. This is not always the case in volcan volcanic situations. And I particularly wanted to put uh, this eruption up here because we've just got to the one year anniversary of this eruption. So literally this time last year, Fuego Volcano, uh, you can see it being quiet here in the background in, in Guatemala, uh, essentially uh, massive pyroclastic flows coming down the side of the volcano. It wiped out several villages. You can see this is uh, that one of the villages here that it completely overwhelmed. And in the end, uh, its records still aren't entirely complete, but death, or, death of several hundred people uh, basically from, from this volcanic activity. So just to remember that, uh, or th that in many parts of the world, for many communities, these, these actually getting these sorts of understanding volcanic behavior really is very much a matter of life and death. I've worked in Guatemala and I find it very sobering. So um, a couple of us went over from Oxford a few years back now and we were working with uh, the volcanologist, the chief volcanologist there. Um, and he was, he, I think he was funded for three quarters of the, of the year. And Guatemala has four or five persistently active volcanoes, of which Fuego is just one of them, and they're all hazardous in different ways. And then tens of potentially active volcanoes. And this guy was funded for three quarters of the year. The funding's gone up a little bit since then. But there were two of us from Oxford, both volcanologists, and we have no active volcanoes in Oxford, as far as I'm aware. Um, and uh, no potential of having active volcanoes there. So it really, for me, was a very sobering illustration of this disparity of resource around the world in terms of managing the different hazards and the different hazard scenarios. So what I want to talk about today is a little bit about some of the techniques that we use to try and understand volcanoes and to understand volcanic hazards at different parts of what I'm going to call the eruption cycle. Um, it's not really a sort of cycle as such in terms of being regular and predictable. Volcanoes are inherently unpredictable systems, but I wanted to use this as a sort of illustrative framework to kind of, for, for us to think a bit about when we want to understand different things about volcanoes. So just to illustrate things here, this is actually a rough representation of the seismic trace from the Mount St. Helens eruption. Um, in 1980 in uh, the United States. Um, and so I'm just using this to illustrate the kind of different phases that we think of sometimes when we're thinking about an eruption. So we think about a period of unrest, a period of eruption, and then a period of relaxation after the eruption. 
Um, and this is what the seismic trace looked like coming out of Mount St. Helens in 1980. And I think um, in those days, it was still just a, a needle on a, on a barrel uh, turning around and, and vibrating when there, was, uh, when there were earthquakes. So you get earthquakes and volcanoes for a number of different reasons. When the crust breaks, when rocks break, because magma's moving around on the volcano, that gives you little earthquakes. But also if you get gas or other fluids moving around in some, inside the volcano, that can also, sometimes you can get sort of resonances and things like that going on in the gas and things like that. So you see we start off with this, this un, unrest period here, which is in the, in the earthquake there, and it's, it's sort of... Uh, fairly calm, and then you see these, these darker periods there where the, the trace is starting to really, really pick up. And this is the event rate, so this is how many events are happening per second. And we have different, as well as the changes in the seismic trace, we have different things going on. So during this unrest period at Mount St. Helens, um, this is the same seismic period here, we also had uh, some small eruptions, some small phreatic eruptions. That means there's some external water involved, perhaps an aquifer. Um, that, is the, that the magma is interactive with inside the volcano. This also means we've got a change in the amount of gas coming out of the volcano here. So we're beginning to see things are changing deep down underneath the old volcano. It's, it's, entering, it's entered a state of unrest. Things are not stable. And then in the case of Mount St. Helens, um, a big bulge started forming on the northern side. So you can see this, this, this person with an umbrella here in the foreground for scale, and this, this bulge here. So this is something else that's happened, is that volcanoes change shape when they're uh, entering a period of unrest. And you don't always get that happening. You don't always get changes in gas, but these are some of the symptoms that we as volcanologists uh, go to, to have a look at. And we'd like to have information on these different... Uh, these different symptoms of the volcano going into a state of unrest. So at Mount St. Helens, that unrest resulted in an eruption. And we had an eruption. This is a, a picture. Actually, what happened first was this side blew out of the volcano. And I don't know if you've ever seen any of the photos, but it just all these trees on the side of the volcano here just got swept away, and they just looked like match matchsticks um, scattered uh, around. And you can still see all the stumps, actually, if you go and visit Mount St. Helens today. But then it formed this big column of ash and gas. So I put, picked out sulfur dioxide, because I'm going to talk about that later, that's in this, this column here of ash and gas, punching up into our atmosphere. So the, all this sort of stuff is going on. And this, this type of activity, this big kind of eruption column, but even smaller scales of, of activity, they have hazards associated with them. So we saw the pyroclastic flows associated with the Fuego volcano in Guatemala. Um, and that lateral blast did kill many people in the, in the area of Mount St. Helens. But actually, the more widespread problems were with the ash deposit. This is a contour map here showing the ash. There's the volcano. Uh, this is about... Um, uh, 200 kilometres, just 250 kilometres, the scale bar here, to give you an idea of, of where it was going. So you can see this contour map of ash spreading out from the volcano here. This, the, the stuff that looks like snow here is actually ash. I really like this just because it's a sort of, these are the martyrs clouds, which are all about the convection going on in the ash, ash column as it spreads out. So this spread ash out over a large area of the United States, and then um, after the eruption finished, we entered into this relaxation stage, which actually with Mount St. Helens ended up being this lava dome forming phase here. So this is all hot magma that's just being squeezed out of the volcano slowly. But when this was going on, people wanted to know if that activity was stable, if it was going to change again, if something else was going to happen. So in this talk, I, um, I want to kind of really explain some of the information and give you a couple of examples of the ways in which we look at uh, basically understanding unrest. So then we're looking into some precursor signals and issuing alerts and into that. And I'm going to use the example of Santorini volcano in Greece. And the sort of heart of the, heart of the question there will be when or will it erupt and trying to understand what's going to happen um, in the future. And then in the second part of the talk, I want to um, give you some examples about how we manage eruption impacts and hazards. So an eruption's actually happening, populations are being affected by it, and what sort of data do we bring to pay to try and actually help to understand processes going on 
uh, and how we can manage that better. So we're, in this, we're then in this eruption and relaxation stage, if you like, of the, uh, of the, um, uh, the diagram right here. And I'm going to choose a different Icelandic volcano. I'm not going to talk about Ayrthat Jökull today. I'm going to talk about the Holleran eruption, which I'll give you a bit of background to. Um, I'm going to talk about, in both cases, about how we use ground-based techniques, but how we build those together with satellite techniques in order to give ourselves a better understanding. So starting off with uh, Santorini Volcano. Now, as a volcanologist, one of the things that we do when, we, when we're starting to study a new system is really to try and learn as much as we can about what the system did in the past, but also to the under, understand the underlying processes that have made the volcano what it is. So Santorini Volcano is located here. So it's, uh, it's, uh, it's um, here uh, basically uh, in the Aegean Sea, um, and it's associated as a subduction zone volcano. The cause of the volcanism is the subduction of this African plate here, moving roughly northwards uh, and basically subducting under the Aegean plate. The tectonics in this area are really quite complicated. There's lots of different stuff going on. You can see these different lines showing different types of movement. Um, and actually, this is what we call an arc of volcanoes because of the shape of the, the rough line that they make. But in, in this particular area of the world, we tend to get these liniments of volcanoes arranged along the, the arc here. So you can see that Santorini is the middle of three volcanoes, Christiana and then Colombo, um, basically both sides of it here. Um, and what, happen, what happens when this plate gets subducted under that plate, these tectonic plates, um, this, 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 uh, the, the fluids, the water that comes off this plate, cause the mantle underneath uh, this arc area to melt. And that's why we get the volcanoes. So if we zoom in um, and look at a, a NASA Lancer image of Santorini, you can see that it's not just one island, it's a, it's a series of islands. This is the, the airstrip, this is the, the landing runway, just to give you a, a sense of scale here. So you can see this sort of beautiful moon-shaped island, this island of Thera, which is the biggest of, of the islands here. But you also see these sort of fragments forming roughly a sort of circle with uh, Theracea here, and that pretty sea here, this tiny little sort of fragment left behind. Um, and then you can just about make out, uh, but we've got two other islands in the middle here. We've got Neocomene and Paleocomene, which basically mean new and old fire here in the, the middle of the volcano there. So we've got a, a series of uh, islands. Um, and as geologists, we sort of like to look at this image, but then we like to make this image look like that image. And this is basically a geological map of the island that's been drawn, obviously, using aerial photography uh, and satellite images, but also by tramping around the island and mapping out where different rocks come out on the surface. And what you can see here is you can see some complexity. You can see some carbonates. These are some limestones here that are the basement. Um, but the sort of broad features I want to draw your attention to are these. This red area is the new volcanics, the new volcano in the center of the, uh, center, center of the islands there. And then the fact that most of the island is actually covered in what we call the Minoan Tuff, uh, which is this grey area here. And the reason that most of the island is this grey colour here is that was the last big eruption of Santorini, and that covered the whole of the surface of the island. So that's what most of the surface of the island is made up with, is this latest big eruption here. Um, Santorini is very beautiful, another recommended holiday destination, uh, I'm uh, obviously uh, selling volcano holidays today, Iceland, then follow it with Santorini, and, uh, um, but uh, it apparently has the best sunsets in the Aegean. I, I think I've only been to Santorini, so for me it does have the best sunsets in the Aegean because it's the only sunsets I've seen in the Aegean. Um, but just, so, just to give you uh, an impression that we're actually looking at this headland here highlighted from this box... Um, and you can see the main town of Thera, these sort of beautiful white houses just clinging onto the edge of the cliffs here. Um, so you'll notice, you'll look at this, you'll, you'll notice that the cliffs are kind of stripy. And actually, these cliffs tell us the history of the volcanoes. They kind of unlock its secrets in terms of deep into time. 
Um, and what, you, what people have done over a number of years is to, to, to tramp around Santorini, to climb down these cliffs wherever it's safe to do so, and to actually log, to actually draw pictures and take samples and log the different rock units that are exposed in the cliffs and other places. But you can actually begin just by looking at this photo to see some things here. You might notice this is the Minoan Tuff, this Minoan, this latest big explosive eruption unit here. Um, so just you can get a bit of a sense of scale from these houses. So it's uh, tens of metres of, of thickness up here. But you might notice that there's another rather similar coloured layer here. So by making that observation, you're kind of taking the, the first steps in terms of un unlocking Santorini and the, the secrets of the past volcanic activity. And what geologists have done over the years, if my projector will work, there we go, uh, is, to, is, is basically to give these units different names and to connect them up where they, where they outcrop around the island. So you can see this is the Minoan unit here, and that other unit I've picked out here is called Lower Pumice II. And if you go um, walking around the island and trying to put all these together and also taking some of the rocks and taking them back to the lab to find out how old they are, you could build up a stratigraphy. So this is just going from old down here to young up here. This is the Minoan unit that we've got here. And you can see quite a lot of this bit of the stratigraphy is missing here because Lower Pumice II is actually this place in the stratigraphy. So what we have here is the old volcanics to the new volcanics going up. And you see we've been able to get some dates on some of these rocks. So they go from sort of lower pumice one is about 200,000 years ago and then about 4,000 years ago for this, this Minoan unit up here. Um, and we've got some interesting changes, which I won't go into too much here, but we've actually, what you can see here is two explosive cycles of the volcano. So we go from a different type of rock chemistry uh, and the eruptions in the first cycle here get progressively larger. So you can see the sort of thinner layers here getting up to this thicker lower pumice two unit here. And then the volcano seems to reset itself and go through the same sort of uh, type of cycle of behavior over another um, long, long time period up to the Minoan unit again. So we've got, these, we've, we've, we've got these very, very big explosive eruptions going on on Santorini that we can tell about because we've got these wonderful exposures of the rocks. Um, and actually, the, these very large eruptions have shaped the island. You can see that uh, associated by, by mapping out the structures that we see, the patterns that we see in the islands themselves, we, we can then basically see... Uh, how the island has responded to these very, very big explosive units. So these very big explosive units clear out the magma chamber that's under the volcano, and that causes a degree of collapse underneath. It's like, uh, so we were just talking over dinner, and someone had said they'd seen somebody do this with kind of flour and water making a crust and then deflating a balloon underneath. You deflate the balloon underneath, and then the flour and water crumbles, and you get something called a caldera forming. And what you have at Santorini is you have these very, very large eruptions happening, and then calderas forming after the eruption or during the eruption, which have hollowed out the, the middle of the island like this to leave this, this big uh, sort of a lagoon, if you like, um, within, within the island. So we've got this interplay of the explosive eruptions with their collapsing, but there's something going on in between as well. So if we look at these, these, these lavas, these are not explosive products, they're lava products. They're, they're from flowing rock down the sides of the volcano. And we can date these lavas using the stratigraphy, but also radioactive decay, to be fitting between two of the explosive eruptions. So what we have is these very, very big explosive eruptions, but then between them, you have a, what we call effusive eruption. We have building uh, of the volcano. The volcano destroys itself, and then it builds itself up again. And I think perhaps the most striking example of this, this is, again, that town of Thera. We're now over this part of the slightly more northern part of the island there is what we call the Scaros Shield, which you can sort of really almost see the old volcano sitting there as a peninsula now uh, into, the, uh, into the lagoon. And this, this was the, the, the edifice that was built in between these two explosive eruptions here. So what we have is we have explosive eruptions going off, causing collapse structures that have built the sort of lagoon structure here. And then in between them, the volcano is building itself up again uh, inside that lagoon before it destroys itself. So we've got two types of cycles of behavior that have created this island we see now. 
and they're both, these explosive cycles go from here to here and then here to here that we've just seen two of, each lasting about 180,000 years. And then between those explosive eruptions, uh, which, that, which also then cause these collapses of the different calderas within there, we also see a build-up and we're currently build, the, the volcano is currently building itself up with these Khomeini Islands in the middle right now. So if we focus it on the Khomeini Islands, um, basically, I've, I've said these, I've, ex I've, I've um, explained these points already. Uh, this is where the most recent activity is. So if we're thinking about the future hazard, we really want to focus on what's going on here. And another wonderful thing about Santorini is that we actually have... Um, 2,000 years of historical observations. We have people in this area writing stuff down for thousands and thousands of years. So we actually have a record of when the Khomeini Islands first emerged from the lagoon here, from this historian Strabo. Um, and we also have a much more modern record of what's been going on. So the last eruption was in 1950. So as I said, the typical eruption styles are minor explosions and lava flows. So we're not talking about a big Minoan eruption. And the hazard at Santa really right at the moment is really not in, in the form of a massive explosive eruption that will impact the whole region. It's in terms of a small-scale um, eruption that will really impact the local uh, people and also the local tourist trade. Um, and using the historical eruptions that we have, we can actually build up this sort of lovely picture of these sort of maps of the different lava flows that we have on the Khomeini Islands. Um, and we can ask the question, what next? And we can also look at these. This is, a, this is the geological map of the Khomeini Islands. And there are also some kind of mysteries when you just look at the sub-aerial expression here. So just to focus in on these micro Khomeini lavas down here. Uh, and one of the things that occurred to us when we were looking at this map is it was strange because this very really rather small lava flow here didn't really seem to tally with the, an eruption that was reported in the historical records of lasting a full year. So one of the things that we wanted to do was to sort of explore whether this, this, this sub-aerial uh, structure, this above-the-water structure of the Khomeini Islands, was just the tip of the iceberg. And of course, it must be, because there must be something supporting it. But we wanted to understand what was going on, what sort of structures we had underwater. So we, we got a LIDAR survey. So this was uh, the, the NERC, the Natural Environment Research Council aircraft, to fly some flight lines with, uh, with a, a weak energy laser beam pointing down so we can actually map out the digital elevation, get a, dig a very detailed digital elevation model of these islands and really understand the shape that they, the lava flows have. But we worked with some Greek colleagues as well to do marine surveys, so a series of marine surveys, trying to get the boat cl as close in doing echo sounding around these islands as possible. And that's actually allowed us to stitch everything together into this much more complete map of the Khomeini Islands, and it's kind of hard to, but this is the, you can see this is the, the shoreline that I was showing in the previous slide around about here, um, and you can just about pick it out, because there's this area here where they couldn't get the boat in, it's terribly technical, they couldn't get the boat in shallow enough, safely, so you get this area of really poor resolution uh, around the coastline like that. So there's sort of a lot to more secrets of the volcano, so you remember I showed you those micro Khomeini lavas there, we were actually able to see that most of that eruption flowed out under the water. So this was a sort of uh, solution, really, to the sort of mystery about why we had so much, so little uh, expression of that eruption. But it also allowed us to try and look at how predictable the volcanic system was. So just from the historic records alone, we were able to look at the gap between eruptions, so the pre-eruption interval here, um, and the length the eruptions uh, lasted. Uh, and just mapped them out, so we sort of put them onto this, this graph here, and saw that it was actually a pretty good relationship, with the exception of 1950, which, uh, which was a, 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 bit of a, a, a bit of a strange one, but is a good reminder that volcanoes like to be unpredictable. Um, but we saw this sort of pretty linear uh, relationship, really, between the gap between eruptions. And a similar sort of thing, oh, we've got error bars here, because volume, these are the, this is the volume of lava erupted, but again, a relationship between the volume of lava erupted and the gap between eruptions. Why that's useful, although you have to put it with the caveats of, you know, this is our best understanding of the system, is it allows us to make a prediction of what would happen at the volcano if anything were to happen in the next few years. So it's about 75 years since the last significant eruption. 
And so we'd, we'd expect a, an eruption to be about two to three years long and a lava volume of about 0 0.08 cubic kilometers. So I'm going to come on to when we had a period of unrest, but the important thing here was when we were talking to the mayor of Santorini, we were able to say if something does happen, this is what you can expect, this is what you should plan for. Um, and, uh, uh, and that was useful. So um, what happened in, in 20, uh, 2010, 2011, and 2012? So I had a PhD student called Michelle Parks. Here's a picture of Michelle up at the top here. Another student at the same time called uh, Susie. And um, we had this joke because whenever I set Susie to work on a particular volcanic system, they were using quite similar techniques. Uh, whatever the volcano was doing, it would stop doing it. Um, and wherever she'd go look in the world, uh, volcanoes were doing nothing. So if you wanted an, a period of guaranteed volcanic quiet, you just set Susie to work on Central America and everything just shut down. Uh, which is kind of frustrating. I mean, she did a fantastic thesis, but she had to be quite creative. Um, because because you know, she, she had to make a lot out of null, you know, nothing's happening here, nothing's happening here either. Um, but she, she did some very clever things because of that. Michelle was doing her PhD at the same time as the opposite. So you know, we thought we'd sort of set Michelle to look at Galeras, and Galeras then exploded. Um, so we thought well, it would probably be quite safe to set her to work on Santorini, because as far as we knew, these are... This is, um, uh, th this, is the, this is the seismic release going on here, and we were down over here. And these are the GPS signals. So this is basically showing us how the volcano is changing in shape. So we were in this period here, so we'd have a quick look at the GPS signals, and we knew that it was all pretty flat and well behaved. So uh, one of my colleagues had a lot of data on his shelf about Santorini, and some INSAR data, I'll explain what that is in a minute. And uh, so we thought we'd set it to look at a very small signal in this area of the Kameni Islands where they were, they were sinking ever so slightly. And we thought, that'll, that'll, that'll keep her quiet. Uh, anyway, so this is what the volcano was doing. Uh, let's find a good trace. This is the, the NOMI station, which is a GPS station here. So this is just showing how the, 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 uh, the, the, the Earth is, uh, that, that particular part of the planet is moving with respect to other bits of the planet. So here it is out here, and about here, Michelle started working on the data. And after a few months, we started seeing quite a big change uh, in the data here. So the Parks effect had taken a, taken, taken a, had, its, had its influence on Santorini. And you can see that all the, this is the radial component of the motion. All the different stations basically started, this is the, um, uh, this, is, uh, this is the upwards direction, which is more scatter on it. But you can see everything started moving upwards and outwards. Um, and if you look at the seismic trace, these are the daily, this is the, the NOMI station mo motion, the eastward motion here. And this red line is the cumulative count, and this is the daily count. They were, they were all basically doing nothing. And then they start from the day in 2011, all kicking up. And where the location of all the seismicity changed as well. All the seismicity was out here associated with Columbus volcano, and it all moved into the caldera and started clustering around the Kameni Islands. So, uh, so we really wanted to understand more what was going on underneath the volcano and how Michelle could possibly be involved with it. But um, we, uh, so we, we basically, um, Michelle started looking at something called INSAR data. And the reason we wanted to look at the INSAR data was to understand in more detail, you've got these kind of points on the GPS here, but what we can do with INSAR is actually build up a kind of uh, contour map about the way in which the, um, the planet is moving or the volcano is changing shape. Uh, and this is a satellite technique. And the advantage of a satellite technique is that you can apply it, with some caveats, to volcanoes all around the world. So I'm just going to illustrate how this works. It's a radar. This is actually the Sentinel satellite that we have up in play at the moment. It's a radar satellite. Um, this is my favourite volcano. Someone at dinner asked me what my favourite volcano was. This is Villarica volcano in Chile. You can see it's very happily puffing away, um, a nice, uh, nice bit of gas coming out. It was, I went to, I did, worked on Villarica in 2003 for my PhD. Uh, one of my friends from school had been out six months beforehand, and I asked her what it was like. She said, "Oh, it's, um, it's very, very, it's very, very pretty." But we got up to the top, and it absolutely stank. And I was like, "Yes." Brilliant. I was going there to study the gas. So, um, so she, she 
continue to think I was quite odd. Um, but, uh, but anyway, the, the, the satellite goes over and it sends out a radar beam like this. And then it bounces back and it measures what comes back. And it measures which part of that cycle, which, what's, what the phase of that radar beam is. So is it at the top of the trough or is it at the bottom of the trough? It basically um, measures that. So here's some, this is uh, Via Rica actually erupting. I forgot which year this was actually, which is embarrassing. But uh, Via Rica absolutely actually erupting here. So you see it's got a really big, juicy magma chamber, which is emptying out. And there it's emptied out. And Via Rica's, uh, you can just about make out, Via Rica sunk into the Earth. Obviously a bit of an exaggeration. Um, and now the satellite sends its beam out again when it comes back over. Um, and you can see that you've got a difference in the phase. So we've got that going to that. And what you can do is you can look at that difference in the phase. You can, you can do processing to understand that. And that can tell you how much the volcano has moved away from the satellite or towards the satellite if it's, if it's swelling up. So we can, we can use that satellite technique to actually understand the way the volcano is changing. And what we get out is a, a sort of contour map like this. So this is what Michelle, one of the maps that Michelle was looking, so she was looking at the difference between March and December 2011 um, in terms of the, what the satellite was seeing. This is actually a satellite called NVSAT, not Sentinel. Um, and what we have here is a contour map showing uh, the red colours are showing where the, 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 the ground has moved towards the volcano. So this is about eight centimetres towards the volcano. It's a pretty sensitive technique. We can see things that below uh, centimetres change. Um, and you can see this sort of bullseye pattern. It's uh, unfortunate the sea's in the way, so it makes it a little bit more tricky, uh, developing around the volcano. And what she was able to do from that was some modelling. She was, she was able to imagine what you might have inside the volcano that was changing volume. And you can search, you search around the location of it, both in terms of where it is within the caldera, but also how deep it is within the earth. And you do a trade-off with basically uh, working out what that signal would look like and comparing it to what you've actually measured. And you try and minimise your misfit. You try and minimise the difference. And that allows you to have some understanding of what's actually causing the deformation we're seeing, um, uh, we're observing, uh, measured from space or from the GPS receivers uh, in terms of what's going on at depth. And the modelling that she did told us that we had a, a roughly spherical source. There's a lot of assumptions involved with a volume of about 0.01 to 0.02 cubic kilometres and about four kilometres depth. And, it was at two pulses as well, though that's, uh, that's less important here. And the interesting thing is that this four kilometres depth here actually uh, tallied with a lot of the other evidence we have about where the shallow magma storage is in Santorini. Um, she was also able to say, because of that uh, graph that we'd drawn earlier, thinking about the volume uh, to uh, um, repose period, so the, the, the time since the last eruption, if you remember, we'd said it was about 0 0.08 cubic kilometres we were predicting. We're about to say that it probably isn't going to erupt right now. Because we've, only got about, we've only got about 25 maximum, about a quarter of the magma in the shallow system that we'd expect to need to feed uh, that volcano, that volcanic eruption. And uh, the, the unrest actually ended in 2012. So what we know is that we've got, a, we've, got a, we've got a big batch of magma sitting there in the shallow system, but it's not enough just yet to actually push the volcano into an eruptive state. So we, we, we have a good um, understanding and we'll, we'll be interested to see what happens on Santorini next. So what we've been trying to do now as well is um, we used to have this situation where we were just relying on GPS networks uh, where we, we were monitoring the change in shape of, of let, fewer than 100 volcanoes globally. And what we've moved to with this new satellite era, these new satellites that we have up here, is we're now able to actually monitor volcanic deformation in a much more global sense. So this map here just shows the different volcanoes around the world that have actually been monitored with satellites. We have 620, this is a few years out of date now, but 620 that had had individual measurements made, and then a great number more that actually had had systematic measurements made. So that's when people are looking for periods of decades uh, to see whether they can see changes in the volcano shapes. And of course, the length of time people have been able to sort of observe them, because we've had different satellite coverage in different parts of the world, 
uh, the longer time period you, you want to look at your volcanoes for, the fewer volcanoes will be monitored for that long. Um, but what we can start to do is actually look at the association between, we can almost sort of start taking an epidemiological viewpoint of volcanoes. So we can start to look at the association between volcanoes that have erupted in a given period with those that have deformed to basically try and understand the evidential worth of volcanic deformations. This is just, this was just our very first effort at it because we're just sort of setting things up really for the, the data rich future that we, we hope for with these satellite techniques. Um, and we were just able to look at these associations and draw these sorts of tables where we can look at true positives, so a volcano deformed and we got an eruption, and also true negatives, where a volcano didn't deform but we didn't get an eruption, and then there's also the false positive and the false negative, which are less good news in terms of the evidential worth. And really the one thing to really draw out here was the strength of the true negative. This is just based on a subset of those volcanoes that have been really studied for a long enough period. Um, in that one thing we were able to say, say here is that if, you are, if you're doing global monitoring, if you're trying to target resources, especially in countries like Guatemala that, uh, that have fewer resources, if you use the satellites to find out which volcanoes are not deforming, you've got a better chance of targeting your resources at the volcanoes that might in the future have some sort of activity in the near future, at least. So uh, that's sort of uh, that. That's the, the the looking at volcanic unrest and thinking about whether we're going to have an eruption or not. But just in the last ten minutes, I will talk a little bit about how we manage impacts when we do have an eruption going on. And the eruption I'm going to talk about is this Holleran eruption. This was in this is 2014 to 2015, so relatively recently. Um, and it was a very different type of eruption to the Ayafat Yerkut eruption. It was what we call a fissure eruption, which meant that uh, it, it wasn't massively explosive, but you've got these, these fire fountains and these long lava flows. But it put a lot of gas out into our atmosphere, particularly sulfur dioxide, which we don't actually emit a whole lot of in terms of um, anthropogenic emissions these days. So the Holleran eruption was actually emitted about... 1.5 to 2 times the whole European economic area emissions in 2011, just in, in, those, in those six months. Um, it, was dwarf, it dwarfed all other long-term SO2, sulfur dioxide emitters. So this is both volcanic, natural, and, uh, and in terms of uh, industrial emissions as well. And it was also of interest because in 2012, uh, I, this type of eruption was actually added to the UK risk register. So actually, uh, it was largely because of the the, Larky, the evidence from a, a previous eruption, which I'll show, I'll show you, uh, that this was this was added as a potential air quality, largely an air quality issue. So just to put it into into perspective, this is the volume of magma that the Ayafat Yerkut eruption put out. So you can see all that caused a lot of trouble. It was really a very small eruption on the scale of Icelandic eruptions. Uh, then the Grimsvert eruption that some of you might have uh, might remember from the next year, which also closed Scottish airports for a bit as well. Um, and then we have Holleran down here, uh, which we're, we're starting to get up to a couple of cubic kilometres of magma. And then this Larky eruption, which is a historical eruption from the 1780s. It lasted uh, longer than Larky, but it put out an order of magnitude, more, more, mag more magma. Here and some of you might have heard about the Larky eruption because it really was a big event. It sort of, the, it actually killed about a quarter of the population of Iceland, largely from famine and fluoride poisoning after the eruptions. And it also had lots of air quality impacts in terms of northern Europe. And some people say things like it's of course the French Revolution and stuff. I'm not sure I uh, entirely understand uh, understand the politics that time as well enough to to fully comment. Um, but the, the, in terms of Iceland, the Holleran eruption was significant because it was the first time that sulfur dioxide concentrations had actually reached dangerous levels in modern Icelandic history. So as I said, there's this sort of cultural memory of the Larky eruption, perhaps, and all the problems that caused, but the, the, the modern Iceland hadn't really experienced this. You can see these two, the, two young chaps on their way to school kind of reacting to the volcanic gases here by sort of... Uh, wrapping their faces in, in materials which unfortunately probably won't really help things too much. So sulfur dioxide gas, um, if you ever do go to a volcanic air, area, it's the, it smells a bit like burnt matches, if you can smell it. 
Um, sometimes the, the gas that people kind of think of more associated with volcanoes is actually hydrogen sulfide, which is your classic rot rotten egg smell. Um, I once did a radio thing for the World Service and spent a long time, it seems, um, discussing how volcanic gases smell. And the presenter listened politely and just went, are you like a connoisseur of volcanic gases? Uh, and I sort of thought, yeah, so it's probably not. I haven't, haven't yet got business cards printed up, but maybe that's, maybe that's too much. Um, but anyway, these, these guys are trying to protect themselves from the, the smelly gas. They can obviously smell it or they wouldn't be doing this as they, they head into school. Um, and the other thing, so one of the, prob one of the things that after the Larky eruption, there was a lot of talk of this dry haze. And the thing with sulfur dioxide, it's a gas, it can cause health problems. Actually, the, the health problems of sulfur dioxide exposure are quite well known. But it also reacts in our atmosphere. It oxidizes, reacts with various different components of the atmosphere to form sulfuric acid, which kind of sounds bad enough in itself. Uh, sulfuric acid isn't something that you're going to kind of you know, want to put in your air freshener or anything like that. But, uh, but it also forms a fine particulate haze, so tiny little droplets and particles in the atmosphere. Um, and uh, these can have uh, very nasty uh, health effects as well. So there was a lot of coverage, uh, probably about 18 months ago. That's probably one of those things where I think it's 18 months and it'll turn out to be five years. But um, about PM 2.5 and basically this these fine particulate matters and how many deaths worldwide, largely to do with urban pollution, were being associated with this, this PM. So volcanoes are a source for sulfur chemistry, essentially a particulate matter in our atmosphere. So the volcano emits gas and then it changes as it goes off and is transported downwind. It changes a lot of ways, but sulfur dioxide to sulfate aerosol is the one to highlight here. So when this eruption happened, we actually went off and did a bunch of different things to try and understand what it was doing to the local atmosphere. Um, and one of the things was actually to get onto the ground and make measurements. So we were making our own measurements, but we were also working with the local scientists to actually use their networks, their air quality networks they already had. So one of the great things about Iceland, it's a, you know, a well-resourced country and it's a well-organised country as well. Um, and so they do have good air quality monitoring um, anyway. So we were doing near source measurements, which I won't talk too much about today, but I'm going to show you some photos of. Um, uh, but we were also making some measurements both in Reykjavik, and this was also using the local continuous sulfur dioxide and particulate matter monitoring. And they also have um, aerosol uh, actual compositional samplings. So they actually know what, what it's made of as well there. And then we also worked at this place, uh, which I haven't ever managed to pronounce correctly in Icelandic. So I'm going to call it Close Town. Um, but this is the place I mean, and if there are any Icelandic uh, speakers in the audience who feel like giving me another lesson afterwards, I'd be very grateful. Um, I, I, I have tried. Um, so close down here had about 300 inhabitants, and again, we had continuous sulfur dioxide monitoring, and we were also making a bunch of, of other measurements here as well. Um, so this work was done with Anya Schmidt, who's here in Cambridge in the Chemistry and Geography Department, and also Evgeny Ilyansky, who's actually from Iceland, but currently works in Leeds. Uh, and this is, these, this, these are, this is Anya and um, Evgenia making monitor, monitoring measurements right up close to the eruption here. Um, so you can see it's a rather spectacular icy environment with this fire uh, in the background. Um, this is, they got some helicopter time. So this is just a looking out of the, this was an infrared camera, looking out, you can see the type of uh, eruption we have here, these fiery trails of, of lava pouring down the sides of the volcano, uh, and they're fly, flying around, and there's the, um, there's the ice cap, the Vatnajökull ice cap over here as well. Uh, but they're also making measurements. This is close town. You, you see what I did there. Um, and this is a schoolhouse in, in close town. Um, and uh, you can see this is Evgeny's office for a few days uh, with all sorts of uh, nice pumps and uh, measuring equipment here. And they had sampling lines running out of the window so that they could actually understand. I hope that they weren't running the pumps while the children was there. I couldn't make the field campaign, although, uh, unfortunately, for family reasons. But, you know, you see all this beautiful artwork, and you don't, I don't like to think of the children having to kind of battle against the noise of this beastly-looking pump We're trying to... Uh, enjoy their education. Um, but to show you some of the data that we got from this, so this is the close town here, so remember this was 
uh, claim. This is the this is sulfur dioxide measurements, and what you can see is um, you can probably tell this this is this is good air quality, moderate, and then this is unhealthy air quality. So if you're asthmatic, for example, you'd be struggling in this amber zone down here. And you can see that uh, we had 88 hours or 10 days when we were actually up in this amber zone in, in the close town there. And in, in Reykjavik, in the distant capital, as I would just try to keep to pretend that I haven't caught, I can't I hide the fact I can't pronounce this name by calling it distant capital and close down. Um, but uh, you can see it's sort of peaking less into, but you've got a much larger population, so many more potentially sensitive individuals there. Um, but one of the interesting things we found was drilling a bit more into this Reykjavik time series. So here again, we've got the daily SO2 and then dates in 2014 along this axis here. And this is the, the safe limit, if you like. And what you can see is the sulfur dioxide getting into dangerous uh, limits several times uh, during, the, during the time series here. But what was interesting was this day on the 20th of September, and we had this, um, this, this testimony from one of the environment agency workers uh, basically saying that this day was, it had, you know, eyes and throat were burning, but the sulfur dioxide, because they were monitoring it in real time, uh, was, only, was only down here. It was sort of only about, the, I think the maximum was about 80 um, micrograms per cubic metre. So you know, later in the eruption, when it got to very, very much higher levels, the, the eyes were not burning as much. So this was puzzling uh, for, for the people who were just looking at the sulfur dioxide trace. And actually, it all became much clearer when we put the sulfite, the sulfate and the particulate matter on top of that. And what we see in this day, on this 20th of September day, is that sulfur dioxide levels, so that's you know, sulfur dioxide from the volcanic plume, were actually very low. But we had this massive peak in terms of the sulfate aerosol. So the, the ill effects they were feeling had, had nothing to do with the sulfate, uh, sulfur dioxide. They were all to do with the sulfate aerosol. So what we then start to see is we've got two types of plume here. We've got a plume with low sulfur dioxide and a high sulfate, and another plume with high sulfur dioxide and high sulfate. So we've got two types of plume going on. And actually, what we have here is a mature plume and a young plume. So we've got two different things that we have to be worrying about. So this is the plume that's come straight from the volcano here, whereas this plume here has actually had time to age and the sulfur dioxide has been changed into particulate matter, into acidic aerosol that is impacting on the population there. And what was uh, interesting for us um, as a group was this, this hadn't been included in the Icelandic Met Office um, pollution prediction forecast. They were just looking at where the sulfur dioxide plume was going. So this is the September official forecast, and you can see that the Reykjavik area was supposed to have good um, air quality. Uh, and the sulfur dioxide was going off like this. Um, so just to say a little bit about the, uh, how we tried to understand this effect, what we did is to use satellite measurements, but to combine these with ANIA's, um, ANIA's, basically, uh, ANIA's chemical modelling of how volcanic plumes change as they go through the atmosphere. So we were using the satellites to initiate um, the, the, the conditions that we needed to start off the volcanic modelling. So this is just using one of the Met Office dispersion models, but with chemistry built into it as well. Um, so the chemistry built in being things like that sulphur dioxide to sulphate aerosol chemistry I was looking at. And the satellite itself offer us very powerful ways of really understanding things on a completely different scale. So this is just an illustration of the sulphur dioxide swirling around the northern hemisphere, originating from the volcano here in Iceland using one of the infrared sensors that we have at our disposal here. And so what we can do is build these different things together to actually understand what was going on. So if we go back to that day, that 20th of September, um, this is what the, the, the prediction from the satellite, uh, using these satellite images to help us to initiate the model, so to decide what starting conditions we use. This is the sulfur dioxide plume here. And you can see that it's, it's sort of similar to the official prediction. It's going up a bit north, but it's mainly just going off coast of Iceland and causing no problems whatsoever. Whereas if we then build the chemistry into it as well, so we're now looking at that sulfate aerosol. This is the product from the, the oxidation product from the sulfur dioxide. What you then see is you see this dark 
uh, green plume going in a slightly different direction. So that's the older plume there that is swirling around a bit like a snake and ducking back in to, to Reykjavik area there. And it was this dark green plume here uh, that's actually from the chemical processing in the plume that was causing those respiratory problems in the capital on that day. The other thing, running this for the whole eruption, we were able to see that actually um, Iceland had had a pretty uh, near, near miss. So again, this is the sulfur dioxide, the young plume, on a, uh, a day earlier in September, going off over the, the Arctic Sea up here. But what you can see is this, this is now the sulfate, that aerosol-rich plume, that older plume there. And you can see this massively high concentration, these very warm colours that are just lying over the North Atlantic here. And you can see the arrows that, fortunately, it was travelling up in this direction, missing both the United Kingdom and Iceland. So if weather conditions had been a little bit different, we could have got some really serious fumigation over Ireland, the United Kingdom, or potentially Iceland itself in terms of these ground-level uh, smogs. So that's really I want to, where I wanted to leave it, uh, just to sort of hopefully give you a, a couple of take-home messages and final thoughts. It's just that I hope I've sort of shown you some of the new technologies that we're trying to uh, push forward, particularly the satellite measurements, uh, in terms of actually trying to build up more of a regional to global understanding of how we both predict volcanic hazards, but also uh, monitor their impacts in the wider sense. So these, they have the ability to really help us at all different stages of the eruption cycle. But also, I hope I've kind of um, convinced you that some of the strongest lessons we get uh, when we're using these satellite techniques and actually trying to understand volcanoes in general is where we try and bring together or integrate evidence from multiple sources to really understand the volcano as a whole. Um, and I'll, I'll leave you with that. So thank you very much. <laughs>